Hello everyone, this is Atwar Ratan Babu, working as an assistant professor in the Department of Environmental Engineering and I am dealing with the course Computation Aerodynamics and in today's topic we will see physical significance of uh, CFL and stability condition basically. So what is actually CFL and uh, how it will play a major role for stabilizing the numerical scheme we will see and uh, how do we see stability of a numerical scheme also we will see and uh, uh, previously, we have discussed about the consistency of numerical scheme and the convergence of numerical scheme and uh, basically we have seen that uh, from the lax uh, theorem, so when you have stability and consistency, uh, the numerical scheme will be automatically get converged. So this we have seen and uh, we will have a quick uh, recap of those things and uh, we will see what is the condition of CFL on stability and uh, one more thing we will have to see what is y plus actually so how come the y plus uh, is playing a major role for the stability of the numerical scheme and uh, how do we get the accurate results based on the y plus and cfl number so those aspects we will discuss uh, deeply in today's lecture okay so before that uh, let's have a quick uh, recap of uh, this pdes so we have seen the classification of pde so where uh, these governing equations are uh, modeled based on the second order PD. So this is the generalized equation. So whatever equation you are seeing here, so it is a generalized equation of second order. So all the PDs which are available in the continuity momentum equation. So we will actually uh, see that uh, it will follow this behavior of the second order PD. So that's why we are writing the generalized equation and uh, from there so we have seen only second order one then after that we have seen the chain rule for uh, d phi of x and uh, d phi of y so after doing the chain rule so we frame the second order pda so for uh, with respect to x and with respect to y so equation two and three and uh, we have applied Kramer's rule so when we applied Kramer's rule, so we are uh, getting uh, the value of uh, mixed derivative, which is uh, dou square phi by dou x dou y. So therefore, here you can see that. So for the Kramer's rule, so we have the numerator term and we have the denominator term. When we do determinant, then we'll get this value. So when we do the determinant of the denominator, if it is equal to zero, so what happens? It will be infinite actually. So therefore, so we need to see our condition, what happens when the debt is equal to zero, okay? So uh, when you do determinant, so then the equation uh, we get uh, after rearranging in such a way that plus uh, b dy by dx plus c is equal to zero. So in this form we get, so uh, let us consider k is equal to dy by dx. So therefore, what happens actually? So this will be a k square plus uh, b k plus c is equal to zero. So we have this thing. So a k square plus b k plus c is equal to zero. So uh, in order to find the roots, what formulation we have? So k one, let's say k two is equal to k one comma k two is equal to minus b plus or minus under root of b square minus four a c divided by 2a. So this formulation we have. Now this uh, discriminant part so which is b square minus 4ac so is playing a crucial role to decide whether the equations which we have are uh, elliptic or uh, hyperbolic or parabolic actually. So based on the behavior of this, this discriminant so we will say whether it is elliptic equation or whether it is hyperbolic equation or whether it is parabolic equation. So we gave a criteria here. So if that b square minus 4ac is less than 0, so we say that it is elliptic equation and b square minus 4ac equal to 0, so we have given it as a parabolic equation and b square minus 4ac greater than 0, so we have given it as a hyperbolic equation. Now basically why do we classify? So we have seen that when we do the classification of these equations, we will get the behavior of the flow. So first of all, when we say the flow is elliptic, so we have an imaginary roots. So when we have the imaginary roots, 
So we have characteristic equations, so which are like imaginary. So which we say that so whatever the mode of disturbance we have, so it will be traveled both in upstream and downstream. So in all the directions. Okay, so with an infinite with a speed of sound or let's say with a speed of uh, let's say body or something like that. So but the disturbance will propagate uh, in the throughout the medium. So that will be elliptic. So parabolic. So basically, initialization. Like uh, so, basically, uh, elliptic is uh, based on the boundary value problem. So let's say we have a Laplace equation. So for the Laplace equation, so let's say do square u by so do x square plus do square u by do y square is equal to zero. So let's say we have this equation. So when you want to apply so the boundary condition, uh, like let's say for uh, over a domain like this, so or for all the four walls, you need to specify actually. So basically, the elliptic equation is called the boundary value problem. And if you say parabolic, so initialization. So basically, uh, at time d is equal to zero, what happens? So for the parabolic, so we have dot t by dot t is equal to alpha do square t by do x square. So therefore, what happens actually at t is equal to zero. So what is the value of temperature? Uh, and at that position, let's say x is equal to l. Okay, something like that. Or x is equal to zero. Uh, and x is equal to l, what is the value of temperature at t is equal to? So these conditions we need to give actually. Okay, so for the parabolic. And for the hyperbolic, so we have seen uh, the case of uh, supersonic flow. Okay, so let's again uh, recall so these things. So for the elliptic equation, so you can see that we have these things. So we have seen a is equal to one, b is equal to zero, c is equal to x square. So we have the imaginary roots now. So these imaginary, the meaning of imaginary roots is um, whatever the information propagation we have in the medium or in throughout the domain so or the domain so will be passed both in upstream and downstream and uh, everywhere so and one more thing so when you have uh, a domain let's say this thing so uh, in this domain so when you affect certain point here let's say p this point q also will get affected okay so uh, in the elliptic equation, what we have is so whatever the disturbance you uh, intimate or like you produce in the domain, so that will pass throughout the domain actually. Why? Because elliptic equations, as we discussed, so they are complex in nature and the disturbance propagation will happen in the, throughout the domain. So, what is happening? So, basically, when you take a point, so and uh, at that point, if you create any disturbance, so this will actually reflect the results, okay, of uh, at other locations also, okay. The range of influence will be everywhere, fine. So basically, uh, anywhere you give, so the disturbance will be propagated. So basically, that is uh, what happens uh, in the elliptic equations. Uh, when you see uh, the trichonomy, trichomy, sorry, trichomy equation. So trichomy equation is an equation where, so the based on the value of x, the equation behavior uh, changes. It's like a switching factor. If x value is uh, greater than zero, we will have hyperbolic. If x value is less than zero, we have elliptic. So if uh, we have x value is equal to zero, we have parabolic actually. Okay. So when you have hyper uh, elliptic, already we have discussed the behavior. Uh, when you have, let's say, uh, parabolic in nature. So let us see one example. So here we have, let's say, a wall. Here we have a one dimensional rod. So the length of the rod. Let us take it as L. Let us say coordinate axis. This is x axis and this is y axis. And this is 0, like origin. Okay. So, what happens? So, this is the position where x is equal to 0. 
and this is a position where this is x is equal to l okay so what we should see so at x is equal to 0 at t is equal to 0 so what is the value of temperature okay so this is one thing the other thing at x is equal to l and uh, t is equal to 0 so what is the value of temperature so this also we have to see okay so let us take uh, this uh, transient uh, uh, 1d heat conduction equation so which is dou t by dou t so which is equal to alpha into dou square t by dou x square this is what we have okay so basically how do you how do we discretize it actually so let us do the discretization in uh, power difference method so t of let us take a grid point location so let us take grid points here 1 2 3 let's say this is 4 so let us take this grid point as i and this will be i minus 1 and this will be i plus 1 this will be i plus 2 so instead of giving location 1 2 3 so we are taking index notation where the i value will start from 1 2 3 4 something like that okay if i is equal to 1 what happens that will be 0 okay so something like that now what happens actually so at location i so what t of i is equal of n plus 1 minus t of i to the power of n divided by delta t is equal to alpha into so t of i plus 1 to the power of n minus 2 t of i plus t of i minus 1 divided by delta x squared so this is what we have okay so this is what we have so basically so what is happening here so the value of alpha delta t and delta x so basically they play a major role in terms of uh, some stability aspect so which we will discuss uh, in the further now so this equation if you observe what happens so we have a dependency parameters of uh, i minus 1 and i and i plus 1 okay so when we solve this equation at each and every time level okay at each and every time level so here you can see so let's say t of i to the power of n so what is the meaning of t of i to the power of n so what is the value of temperature at that particular grid point uh, at n is equal to 1 so basically n stands for the time index which will start from 1 2 3 so on n seconds let's say or uh, let's say x seconds something like or some seconds okay so we, we can take now let us take n is equal to 1 what happens if n is equal to 1 what happens t of i 2 minus t of i power of 1 divided by delta t is equal to alpha t of i plus 1 to the power of 1 minus 2 t of i to the power of so here it should be an to the power of 1 plus t of i minus 1 to the power of 1 divided by delta x squared. So here you can see what is happening. So if you want to, so what is the unknown parameter? So basically t of i to the power of 2. So basically t of i to the power of 2 in the sense the value of temperature at this particular grid point at next time level. So initial time level when we give the initialization so when we give initialization, initialization in the sense, so what is the value of temperature at different grid, grid points, we need to give those values. So that is the meaning of the initialization. So when we give that initialization, so we will get the value of temperature. So at i minus 1, at i, i plus 1 and i plus 2. So now what happens actually based on the value of alpha, based on the value of delta t, based on the value of delta x so the temperature at a second step or next step will change so let's say initially we have temperature t is equal to 300 kelvin okay 
so this is at the initial one at uh, t2 so it will change let's say it will either increase let's say 301 kelvin or 302 kelvin so based on the calculation what we have so based on the time step what we choose and based on the delta x so this kind of transient so basically simulations will happen or will go on with for the parabolic equation okay so this is an example so where the initialization is very very important so initial value problem so basically uh, the parabolic uh, equations so basically they are called the initial value problems okay fine so now uh, here when we come to hyperbolic so here there is an equation you can see rho square u by rho t square minus c square into rho square u by rho x square is equal to zero so when you see this wave equation one dimensional wave equation so here we have the speed of the sound or let's say speed of the wave c and you have delta x square and you have delta t so these parameters will govern so basically uh, the stability aspect for the numerical uh, schemes so let's see so what is actually a cfl number okay so CFL number, let's say basically core, uh, current uh, fraud number, so majorly depends on so u delta t divided by delta x. So here the value of u is nothing but the speed of the flow. Okay, so the value of u is nothing but it's the speed of the flow. So delta t is nothing but the time step. So delta x is nothing but it's the distance between two grid points. Okay. So let us take an example. So uh, let us give this as a C O is equal to u delta t by delta x, this formulation. Now, what happens if when CO is greater than 1 and what happens when CO is less than 1? So, these things we have to discuss. So, basically, what is the meaning actually? So, when you have CO greater than 1, what happens? So, you are uh, either u will increase or uh, delta t will increase or delta x will decrease this is a possibility for core number greater than 1 so for core number less than 1 what happens so these are the possibilities which i am saying so either u will decrease or delta t will decrease or delta x will increase so this is another possibility okay so u is nothing but speed of the flow delta d is nothing but time step delta x is nothing but distance between two grid points so let us take uh, the grid okay sample grid for co greater than one so let us take this condition let us take this grid okay Okay, so this is what we have. Now, so what is delta x actually? So delta x is nothing but the distance between two grid points. Let's say we have this is one grid point and this is one grid point. Okay, so that is delta x. So now when delta t is greater than 1 or let's say velocity has increased. So what is happening, you know? So let's say we have a fluid particle. Let's say we have a fluid particle here. Okay. So it has to go in this cell. So let's say if uh, delta d is less than 1, so it will go to this cell. Next it will go to this cell. Next it will go to this cell. So here 
when you have core number greater than 1 so what it does you know so when it is starting from here it will escape here and it will go here okay again from here it will escape and it will go here so when the core number is greater than 1 the fluid particle actually will uh, cross the cells why because the size of the cell is small smaller than the size of the time step so therefore by the time the fluid particle reach wants to reach the cell the size will be very less and it will skip off and it will go to this position actually so this is the scenario when you have coordinate number greater than 1 so we will see other scenario where coordinate number is less than 1 okay so when the coordinate number is less than 1 so let's see what happens okay so here what is the case actually the delta x so let us take this is condition 1 delta x1 and let us take this condition 2 so delta t1 and delta t2 and uh, here you can take this as delta x2 when you compare these two delta x1 will be less than delta x2 so delta t1 will be greater than delta t2 so this cases this is the usual scenario what happens now let us uh, see the same aspect here so when you have this thing so when it is less than 1 so it will easily occupy this point why because the time step is less than the uh, spacing between two grid points so this one okay so and easily it will occupy this position next again easily occupy it will it will occupy this position next again easily it will occupy this position okay why because the coordinate number is less than 1 fine so the delta x is more so what is happening so when you have the delta x less than 1 so the fluid particle is able to uh, go and accommodate in each and every cell easily such that uh, so the stability of uh, numerical scheme is satisfied okay so when the cfl when coordinate number uh, is greater than 1 so usually uh, for uh, low speed air and mix or let's say incompressible flows or let's say compressible flows uh, or let's say you take supersonic hypersonic cases for certain problems so let's say flow over aircraft let's say flow over rocket flow through engine so these kind of uh, cfd studies when you do so you automatically take the core number less than one okay so why because uh, it has to actually uh, study the effects of the boundary layer and it has to be satisfied uh, with the within the cell and these things are required actually so therefore for the stability criteria so we will take co is less than one okay so there will be a play so you basically the u is nothing but uh, so we have co is equal to u delta t by delta x okay so this is the formulation which we have now so basically u is nothing but what is u so that is the flow velocity actually so when you have this flow velocity that flow velocity thing we cannot change so when you have high speeds so which is crossing 110 meter per second or 150 meter per second so we cannot control it so when you want to make it let's say we have flow speed u is equal to 150 meter per second so let's take in another thing okay let's write again here so c y is equal to u delta t by delta x okay so let us assume u is equal to 150 meter per second okay so the criteria is c y should be less than 1 okay so here what we should do 150 into delta t by delta x so this value delta t by delta x should be 10 power minus 3 okay so the value of uh, delta t by delta x should be 10 power minus 3 such that so what happens actually this will be 
zero point one five. So C O, which is less than one. So therefore, what happens actually? So how that uh, ten power minus three will come? So either the time step should be very very small, or the delta x should be very large. So we pre people usually prefer to make the time step very very small. Let's say the spacing delta x, the spacing will be provided basically uh, coming uh, basically from bond layer thickness. So the delta x value also plays a major role in the stability. Why? Because so when let's say your delta x, we are seeing only one d. When we see two d, so you need to see for delta y also. So what? C O is equal to U delta T by delta Y you have. Okay, so when you have C three three D, so C U is equal to U delta T by delta Z. Okay, so we are talking about what only one D. Okay, so now this delta X is basically the spacing between two grid points. So let's take uh, delta Y actually. So now, what is the meaning of delta Y? Here, this is grid point. Let's say phi one. This grid point phi two. This grid point phi three. Let's say points we are taking. So, what should be the spacing between phi one and phi two? So that is a major issue. So, let's say this is the wall. Okay, the phi one is wall, and phi two is the first grid point above the wall. Okay. So, what should be the distance? Okay, so that is very very important. So how do you find out? So should I take it as ten power minus three? Should I take it as ten power minus two? So basically, I'm talking meters. Should I take ten power minus four? So which one I should take? That is very very important. Okay, so there is a concept called boundary layer. Think me, so boundary layer and boundary layer. So already people know it. So again, we'll just discuss. So boundary layer. Is a very thin layer, so which is present adjacent to the wall because of the viscosity effects of the flow. So when you have a flow moving over the solid body or the rigid body, so the first layer of the fluid particle will stick on the surface. Okay, so therefore at the boundary, so the velocity of the flow will be equal to zero. So this condition. We have seen it as no slip wall. Okay, so when the flow is viscous, so these effects will happen. When the flow is inviscid, what happens actually? So will not be equal to zero actually. So this is for slip wall. So this slip wall cases. People use at uh, higher altitudes. Let's say literary, we call it as rarefied dynamics. So when you have the satellite, so let's say that satellite is moving uh, around an orbit uh, at a hundred kilometer above the Earth surface. So the density of the air will be very very less. So the fluid particles which are hitting the satellite surfaces, so will just uh, will not stick actually. So will go off. So therefore, you have a reflection, or let's say, so you have a tangential velocity, or you have normal velocity based on the impact of the fluid particle on the satellite surface. So at that scenario, so people use a slip wall boundary condition. Okay. So when when you have the viscous effects are very predominant, uh, and uh, when you have the flow as continuum, so people basically use no slip wall boundary condition. So in general, we consider. So what happens actually outside the boundary layer, the flow as uh, inviscid. Okay. So here, what is happening? You know, at uh, wall, the velocity of the flow is zero. So here it increases. Let's say it is coming zero point one of a free stream velocity. You need. Okay. So this will be. Zero point two of free stream velocity, zero point five of free stream velocity, so on. Zero point nine nine of free stream velocity. So when you get it as equal to one, so here this is the zone between the 
viscous so this will be viscous or viscid and other one will be inviscid so this zone basically separates uh, the viscous and the inviscid zone okay so now what will be the thickness of bond layer actually so that is one question so why because when we are performing the cfd simulation to capturing the bond layer is very very important okay so why because the bond layer is a thin viscous layer actually outside the bond layer the flow is inviscid so the bond layer will create a shear force on the body okay so and uh, shear stress so basically shear force shear stress and this thing we need to study so when you have the shear thing happening on the body so you have temperature effects coming on the body also so if you are not able to capture the bond layer properly then uh, you will be not able to calculate so what type of load that is acting on the wall so how much amount of stress is acting on the wall and how much amount of temperature is acting on the wall so these things you are not able to capture okay so that is the physical significance so that is the importance of the bond layer thickness now let's see the correlation so what is the bond layer thickness and the non dimensional parameter so we call bond layer thickness delta as so inversely proportional to under root of r e renolds number so already we have discussed in the previous uh, uh, sessions that uh, renolds number r e is nothing but rho v l by mu okay so as you increase the so what is happen let's see this relation so under root of rho v l by mu so when you decrease uh, when you increase the velocity what happens the bond layer thickness delta will decrease will become let's say less than less than 1 okay so you increase density it will you increase reference length it will decrease okay so when you take low viscous flows the bond layer thickness will increase okay so this is what we have so when you keep on increasing the velocity or pre stream velocity the bond layer thickness will decrease actually now we have a small correlation now let us take one small example of which okay so let's say the flow speed here it is u is equal to 450 meter per second okay density rho is equal to let us take it as uh, mm, 1.1 kg per meter cube okay so reference length let us take it as l is equal to 1 meter okay so this cost of uh, let us take it as 1.71 into 10 power minus 5 so this cost units okay fine so let us apply this concept here so the delta is let's say inversely proportional to 1 by so what is 1 1.1 into 450 into let's say 1 divided by 1.171 into 10 power 5 minus 5 so here when you calculate then you will get the thickness of bond layer let's say uh, approximately i'm roughly i'm telling let's say 10 power minus 4 10 power minus 3 10 power minus meter section so okay so when you get the bond layer thickness let's say it has 10 power minus 4 meters your grip point so when you are doing mesh let's say for this thing so when you are performing mesh for this let's say so the first grip point distance should be less than the thickness of bond layer so the delta delta wise sorry so your boundary layer your uh, sorry your grid point should lie within the bond layer okay your your uh, grid point should be lie within the bond why why because you need to capture the data of bond layer so when you are keeping the grid points away from the bond layer let's say here what happens you will skip okay so you will skip the bond layer okay bond layer is like a small fish 
so let's take uh, you have a mesh so when you are using a mesh which is of a larger than the size of fish what happens they will escape through this so similarly the boundary is also like a small fish so when you are not able to mesh it properly okay based on the thickness of the boundary layer so then it's best to use that kind of mesh okay so that is the importance of uh, the spacing between the two grid points so which is correlating with the bond layer thickness okay so uh, with this uh, we have seen so basically what is uh, the influence of uh, co which is coherent number so which is u delta t by delta x and we have seen uh, what is inflow of boundary thickness on the delta x let's say delta y on delta z let's say so we we have seen uh, these aspects okay and uh, the next class so we will see so what type of uh, stability is applied for the fine like forward in time and forward in space scheme and uh, how do you calculate the coherent number there and uh, for different types of atmospheric bond layer problems or let's say for uh, aero and uh, automobile problems so which sort of uh, thickness is used so we have one concept called uh, y plus so basically what is y plus so how do you calculate this y plus okay so how it play a major role uh, in uh, calculating the thickness of the uh, bond so not bond layer so basically the distance between the two grid points so what is y plus actually and uh, why it is playing a major role in placing a grid point location also we will see in the next session thank you like share and subscribe hit the bell icon for more updates